Now, everybody else shot, thought they should wait for the sailing season and put to sea at first gleam of spring because at the time it was still winter and it seemed quite impossible to cross the Ionian Sea. But Chariots was eager to go. His love was such that he was quite prepared to knock a raft together, launch out into the sea, and let the winds carry him where they would. So the ambassadors too were, relu were reluctant to put things off out of embarrassment with regard to him, and especially Hermocrates, and got ready to sail. The Syracusans made it an official expedition to give the embassy additional prestige. So they launched the famous flagship, which was still flying the standards of the victory. On the day appointed, on the appointed day of departure, the people all hurried to the harbor, not just men, but women and children too, and prayers were joined with tears, groans of despair, words of consolation, fear, confidence, despair, hope. Charia's father, Ariston, who was in the grip of extreme old age and disease, flung his arms round his son's neck and clung to him, weeping. My child, he said, to whom are you abandoning me? I am old and half dead already. I shall clearly never see you again. Wait just a few days so that I can die in your arms, then bury me and leave. His mother grasped his knees. I beg you, my child, she said. Do not leave me here all by myself. Take me on board your ship. I shall be a light cargo. If I am heavy and too much for you to carry, throw me into the sea you are sailing on. As she spoke, she tore at the front of her dress and thrust forward her breast. My child, she cried, respect these breasts and pity me if ever I offered you my breast to calm your sorrows. Charius broke down at his parents' appeals and threw himself from the ship into the sea. He wanted to die so as not to have to choose between abandoning the search for Calerho and causing grief to his parents. The sailors quickly leapt overboard and just managed to bring him out of the water. Then Hermocrates told the crowd to disperse and ordered the pilot to set sail finally. Another noble act of friendship took place too. Charia's friend Polycharmus was not to be seen among them at the time. He had actually said to his parents, Charius is my friend, my dear friend, but not so dear that I will risk my life with him, so I shall stay out of the way until he sails. But when the ship had cast off, it was from her stern that he said farewell to his parents, so that by then they could not hold him back. As he left the harbor, Charius looked toward the open water. See, he cried, take me over the same route as you took Calerho. Poseidon, grant, I beg you, that either she return with us, or... I too not come back without her. If I cannot recover my wife, I want to be with her even as a slave. A following wind caught the Triremi, and it ran as if in the tracks of the cutter. They reached Ionia in the same number of days and moored at the same beach on Dionysus' estate. The rest of the ship's company, after landing exhausted, hurried to see their own well-being, pitching tents and getting a meal ready. But Charias, walking about with Polycharmus, said, How can we find Calerho now? I am very much afraid that Theron lied to us and the poor girl is dead. Then again, even if she really has been sold, who knows where? Asia is big. In their wandering, they happen upon the temple of Aphrodite, so they decided to offer worship to the goddess. Charius threw himself at her feet. Lady, he said, if you were, you were the first to show me to Calerho at your festival, give me back now the woman you granted me. As he rose, he saw beside the goddess's statue a golden image of 
Kalerho, which Dionysus had offered. And then his limbs gave way, his heart felt faint. He felt dizzy and fell to the ground. The attendants saw him, brought water, and revived him. Don't be frightened, she said. Many other people have been scared by the goddess besides you. She appears in person, you see, and lets herself be distinctly seen. But this is a sign of great good fortune. You see the golden image? That woman was a slave, and Aphrodite has made her mistress of us all. Why, who is she? asked Charius. The mistress of this estate, my child, the wife of Dionysius, the leading man in Ionia. When Polycharmus heard this, he would not let Charius say another word. He had his wits about him, but raised him up and took him away. He did not want it to be known who they were before they had thought about the whole situation carefully and come to agreement about it. Charius said nothing in the presence of the attendant, but forced himself to keep silence, although he could not stop tears from coming to his eyes. When he was some distance away, he threw himself on the ground alone and cried, Kindly see, why have you preserved me so far? Is it so that I, after my fair voyage, I may see Kalerho, another man's wife? I did not think that would ever happen, even if Charius died. What shall I do in my misery? I expected you... I expected to get you back from a master. I was sure I would win over the man who bought you by offering ransom for you. In fact, I have found you wealthy, perhaps even a queen. How much more fortunate I should have been if I found you begging. Am I to go up to Dionysius and say, Give me back my wife. What, who can say that to a man who has married her? Why? I cannot even go up to you if I meet you. I cannot even offer you the most ordinary of greetings as my fellow citizen. Perhaps I shall even risk death as the debaucher of my own wife. Such were his laments, and Polycharmus tried to comfort him.